Um, and uh, yeah, so as Viv said, this talk will be on mostly on some experiments I've done recently looking at how actually doing a bias search could potentially be an advantage, sort of in an it's not a bug, it's a feature spirit. We all know that, at least natively, the D-Wave doesn't really do fair sampling, but I'm arguing that in some ways unfair sampling may actually give you more interesting solutions in a certain sense. Then I'm going to talk about something that came out of this, which is the domain wall encoding, which seems actually quite useful on its own. And then something that wasn't in the abstract, but are some rather exciting theory results that Viv mentioned in her talk relating to this energy redistribution method for more rapid quenches, I'll, I'll mention at the very end. So, um, just as a note about terminology, for the purposes of this talk, when I say adiabatic quantum computing, I really mean a closed system protocol where I'm trying to maintain the ground state. When I say quantum annealing, I mean a more dissipative protocol. Different groups use this terminology differently, and if you prefer different terminology, that's fine, but that's what I'm using in this particular talk. Um, so, Viv already gave this introduction, but there's five people from our group here, um, all of which who are underlined, um, and great if we could you know, chat to all kinds of people. Um, so, before I begin, let me, or, one of the features that this uses heavily is reverse annealing. Um, I'll explain how it uses it later on, just as a reminder about how that works. Um, basically, the idea is to search more locally, bias toward a state. Um, there's this example I presented at last AQC, where basically, if you anneal back a little bit, you don't do anything. There's a certain sort of sweet spot where you can find a nearby narrow, narrow minimum, and then if you go too far, you find a false minimum, which would trick you in traditional AQC, um, or in traditional quantum annealing. Um, you can see my previous talk for the details on this, which you can find actually on my web page. Um, so, um, let me also point out that reverse annealing has been used quite heavily in algorithms. Um, and there's actually quite a few examples, including the genetic algorithm example, which I don't have up here. Um, there are some other suggestions for genetic-like algorithms that I had previously and some suggestions there. But the point is, these are fairly simple algorithms, but you're already getting some pretty good advantages. Um, so more sophisticated algorithms could do even better. Um, so now, the question is, what else can you do with this feature? Um, and can it be used in some other way? Um, there are several ideas, one of which is what I'll be talking about here. I just wanted to highlight another way you could use it that we are working on, which is to apply what's called novelty search. And the idea there would be if you're on a search range, if you're searching at a very large range, you're probably not actually seeing the relevant features of your energy landscape. And at the longest range, what you may actually want to do is search for answers that are away from your, what you've previously seen. And so the idea would be to combine this with reverse annealing to kind of counteract some of the bias. Um, so that's one idea. The idea I will talk about here is actually finding candidates with other desirable properties, which is the robustness I alluded to at the beginning. So um, what's the basic idea here? Well, if you have an energy landscape picture, you can imagine you have these sort of narrow, if my most optimal single local minimum or global minimums right here very narrow, but maybe if I have something that's a little more energy but less constrained, as in I could tweak the answer a bit, um, that might actually be desirable in many cases. Maybe I have constraints that I couldn't encode. Um, maybe I have something where I actually will want to have to change my solution on the fly. Maybe I don't actually know my problem specifically. So we're going to be looking at how you might use the reverse annealing feature um, combined with known behaviors of annealers to try to find this solution from this solution. So, again, just a bit on why we might want to do this. Um, the example I'm going to give here uses this one, just penalty term that's really expensive, that's global, and then which you add on. Um, so, before I begin, let me give a motivational example um, to 
actually finding broad local minimas in these, or yeah, broad local minimas in these devices. So if I build up some Ising gadget, these are ferromagnetic couplings, these are fields in one or the other direction. Um, this is actually taken from this paper. Um, basically what you can see is you can have a solution where these eight on the outside can be in any state, but it has a higher energy, or you can have a unique robust solution. Turns out if you run this on a 2000Q with the shortest annealed time, you actually find this higher energy solution much more than you find the slower energy solution. And this is a well-known effect with quantum fluctuations. This isn't saying the device doesn't work because one, it did actually solve this problem. And two, if you increase the anneal time, it would actually, you could probably actually flip those two. But this is more just showing that these broad local minimums, it really does preferentially find. And this is a fairly known effect. There was some earlier work on this as well um, by the Vidar group um, looking at early evidence for quantum behavior. Um, Sergio Boixo, I believe, was the first author on that. Um, so now let's look at testing how, how we might actually, a case where I might actually want this robustness. So imagine that I have my problem, an easily embedded Ising problem, in this case a native problem to the chip, um, but I also have a penalty which is basically the hamming distance from some random bit string and does some not funny nonlinear thing with that. Now this would be very hard to encode. You probably need fully connected interactions and realistically on a real device you couldn't do this, but if you have a more robust solution, you might be able to post-process the solution you already have. And so as a proof of principle example, we look at that. We look at, okay, what if we have the gadget I showed a few slides ago and look at the what I called the optimal solution and what I called the robust solution, starting in those, adding on this kind of penalty, and then doing a very simple kind of post-processing. So in this case, just greedy search. Just flip the bits to lower the energy until you can't lower the energy anymore. And what you can see is, of course, if you don't add this penalty at all, you're better off starting in the ground state because this is an excited state. But very quickly, because you can tweak these eight spins, you actually, when you include this additional penalty in post-processing, you're actually better off to start in this more robust state. Now, this is a fairly artificial example, which is why, um, but it's to motivate the idea that robustness in a single solution, in other words, being able to tweak it, could be something valuable. It could be something you might actually want in a solution more than just optimality, and it's something these devices happen to naturally give you. Um, so, um, let's now think about a more complicated case where we actually want to increase robustness of solutions. So let's say we already know a good solution that's not very robust, but then we want to find ones that are more robust. Reverse annealing is one natural feature that could do this because it allows you to search locally, so you could search around your good solution for another still pretty good solution, but one that's more robust. Um, so, to do this, what we do is take some of these gadgets that have been proposed by um, Itehen et al., um, or some of these planted solution problems. We add in a specific kind of gadget, where this gadget, if you're in the planted solution around it, say the um, all minus one state, then this gadget will be in its minimum energy state, but nothing around it will be frustrated. However, you can have equivalent states which do have free spins, do have spins that are allowed to flip, but at the cost of all of these couplers to the outside can't be the same anymore. And so what you end up with is you actually end up with something where you want to search for where can you minimally frustrate here, and we know the optimal state here by construction, by the fact that it's a planted state and we've designed our gadget to also have planted solutions. Um, so what you can do here is come up with examples of searching for more robust states from a solution which is optimal but probably doesn't have any free spins, or if it does, they're just sort of a few by accident, um, but probably doesn't. Um, and so in some ways this seems kind of a diabolical thing to do because we're it's like we're setting it up for failure. We're already starting off in the best solution, but we're actually not looking for optimality only. We're looking at robustness. So let's test this mechanism. 
So when I say number of gadgets free, what I mean is number of these gadgets where some of the spins are free, where they're basically allowed to take either the one or minus one value. Um, and then I look at the excess energy per gadget and just look at the different states I find. This is looking at a few different um, reverse annealing runs and just taking the best of them. Um, and what you can see here is, yeah, the more robust you are, the more penalties you have to pay per number of gadgets free. If you notice this red line here, um, this red line is if you just frustrated these cup, just frustrated one of these couplings and left things where they are. So this red line is trivial, and we're well below that, especially for finding a few gadgets free. And we use another trick, which is anneal offsets, which is basically to try to get these spins and these gadgets to be more, to bias them so they're more likely to be free, basically effectively turning up their transverse field so you get more energy by having free spins. And you can see using anneal offsets in a clever way, you can do even better. That's these dashed lines. Um, and yeah, one uh, so I have these sort of pathological example, or these other examples are where you have gadgets that don't allow the spins to be free. Um, and you can see here, you do significantly worse. So it really is the fact that you're getting an energetic reward by for having free spins that is helping you find these robust solutions. Because you can see this purple line does significantly worse than this blue line. And same with this purple line, which is when you have the uh, anneal offsets. Although for small numbers, it seems like the offsets can actually act like having free spins if you want certain to explore certain parts of your space more, which is kind of interesting. Um, and whether or not you're using this offset trick, the fluctuations can help you find more robust solutions. That's the point here. Um, we can do a similar test to what I talked about before with this post-processing, where you take and you do a greedy search to try to um, improve the energy with, again, one of these penalties that's based on hamming distance from a random state something that would be very, very difficult to implement. And again, you see, um, in this case, the annealer solution performs better. This is looking at states with all different numbers of gadgets free. So you start off 0, 0, because I included the state with no gadgets free, which, in that case, the annealer just found the um, already planted solution it started in. Um, one important thing that I, ha I forgot to mention before is that these free, these gadgets or these problems are hard for the annealer, in the sense that if you ran traditional annealing on this, you wouldn't find the planted solution very often, or at least for the number of runs I did, you never would. Um, so we can look at a more realistic version, which this is where the domain wall encoding comes in, which is inter integer variables. This is already on archive, and a new version appeared Monday. The basic idea here is if you want to encode an integer variable, but don't want to deal with the overheads of um, doing a, a one-hot embedding, um, what you can do is you can put a, a chain where you've included fields on this end and fields on this end so it's frustrated, and basically you can energetically, you can have a ground state manifold which is just all these domain wall positions. Um, so it's a linearly connected subgraph which can potentially help quite a bit with um, doing this. The key real advantage here is that in this case you can include interactions which um, basically your interactions only have to be too local because you can determine whether or not a domain wall is at a site by having plus and minus fields on either side of it and that effectively since that's involving one local terms if you take a product of those it involves only two local terms and so well, naively, you'd think since the energy cost of what you're getting the energy cost here is from a two-body term, you'd think you'd need a four-body term. Actually, if you use this clever trick where you say, is it at a position using this term, which you can, yeah, um, then you can actually um, do much better. Um, so now we can look at this and look at this domain wall encoding of different experiments. And um, we can actually use embedding software 
and look at how much difference does it make versus one hot. And for certain kinds of artificial problems, in particular sort of artificial scheduling problems, it can do quite well. So here, these dashed lines are comparing Pegasus to Chimera, and the, or these blue, uh, black and purple ones are comparing Pegasus to Chimera, and the blue and red are comparing domain wall versus one hot encoding. And you can see right there that blue set of solutions, which is for a set of artificial scheduling problems, more details are in the paper, you get this difference in ratio, which is the ratio of embedded qubits to logical qubits. The difference between one hot and domain wall is scales very similarly to the difference between Pegasus and Chimera. So you can get a similar scale of advantage by using a smarter encoding on some of these problems than you could by having a totally re-engineered hardware graph. Of course, both of these stack. You can do domain wall on Pegasus, and then you get both advantages. Um, so, much the same as before, you can find robust solutions for integer variables, just embed them in this planet solution uh, problem again, um, and basically you can see, here I've plotted actually the value of S prime, how far back you go in your reverse anneal versus number of what I've called soft chains. What I do here is I couple this region of the chain so it will have to frustrate the um, problem on the outside, so this is my optimal state. This is where it's more robust, but I've had to frustrate somewhere else. And you can see, indeed, it searches here where you have more space to play around, more robust. Um, so with that, I'm going to quickly move on to another topic, which I've worked on quite a bit um, with, uh, along with Viv Kenden and a lot of other people in our group, which is looking at going beyond not just to quantum annealing, but also thinking about other ways you can solve problems in continuous time. Adiabatic quantum computing, quantum annealing is what I've just been talking about, but also quantum walk, which Viv talked about quite a bit. And the question I want to ask here is, is there a method similar to reverse annealing which uses all three? But before I do that, let me just back up and remind you why we think quantum walk could even solve optimization problems. Viv mostly covered this during her talk, but the idea is you have this energy redistribution mechanism, effectively because energy is conserved and your energy is just the sum of the expectation values of the, two, of the driver and the problem Hamiltonian, um, and because you're redistributing energy between them, the expectation value of the driver Hamiltonian has to go up if you start in the ground state, the expectation of the problem Hamiltonian therefore has to go down. Therefore, you're at least better than where you started which if it's uh, an unbiased driver, you're better than random guessing, which is at least something. Um, we have papers on this. Um, so we can also interpolate between quantum walk and AQC. And the question is, is there a version of this energy conservation argument that holds here? Um, and the argument is actually there is. If you consider a non-adiabatic quench, or it, it could be adiabatic, but you consider a quench that doesn't have to be adiabatic, but is monotonic, in that the ratio between your driver and your problem Hamiltonian is always decreasing over time, what you can see is you can effectively trotterize this into two kinds of steps. One where you effectively redistribute energy. We've argued that that, on average, will decrease the expectation of your problem Hamiltonian. And one where you're effectively just rescaling the driver. If you're rescaling the driver, Effectively, you're reducing the energy that you are above your ground state there. And since we started initially in our ground state energy and now we're dissipating away from that, you can rather simply argue that actually any monotonic quench will do better than the ground state of the driver Hamiltonian on average. So there's nothing here about whether you'll actually find the optimal state, but it is a statement about average case. It means that if you take the Enter the expectation value of the problem Hamiltonian, um, you will do as good as be or better than what you started with. So now in the last 45 seconds, um, let's think about what I promised a few slides ago, which is how could you do use this for an equivalent of reverse annealing? Um, and poster 26, presented by my grad student Lore, talks about this a bit more. But the idea is, if instead of using a transverse field Hamiltonian, you used a Hamiltonian where the fields are not exactly transverse. Um, this now, the ground state is biased toward whatever solution you want. And now, 
this energy redistribution arguments apply. If this is biased already toward a good solution, now your problem energy expectation value will be less than the expectation value of this bias distribution. So you'll always do better. Um, I will point out very quickly that there has been some recent, very recent work on doing an adiabatic search with this, but they didn't catch any of the redistribution stuff by Tobias Grass. It's quite a good paper. Not my work, but it's, it's very cool. I recommend checking it out. And yeah, take home messages. Um, I'm 20 seconds over, so I'm not going to read them for you. You can. <laughs>